aspettavano così? Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Do you know what the Turing test is? Yes, I know what the Turing test is. It's when a human interacts with a computer. And if the human does not understand what they are interacting with, a computer, that they are interacting with a computer, the test is passed. And what information does that give us? That the computer has an artificial intelligence. You're building an artificial intelligence. I have already built one. And in the next few days, you will be the human component in the Turing test. Oh, holy crap. Yes, that's right, Caleb. You got it. Because if the test is passed, you will find yourself at the center of the greatest scientific event in human history. If you created a conscious machine, this is not the history of man. This is the history of the gods.
Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. The dialogue we have just heard uh, uh, from our uh, skilled actor, Gian Piero Bartolini, is from the film Ex Machina. Our session today is entitled The Machinization of Man and the Humanization of the Machine. That is our topic today. This session comes from two passionate men, two men full of passion, passion for man, passion for the unrepeatable elements that every man, every person, every human being is, that every woman is, that every person is, that every living being is. A passion for the human being and for his life, for the meaning of life, because between functioning or existing, uh, as Miguel Benasayak's book is entitled, there is a great difference. Passion because the peculiarity of the living being, uh, uh, its uniqueness, uh, the fact that it's always in relation with with other beings, its irreducibility, something that we must become aware of today more than ever. The risk, but I believe this is more than a risk, is that we are being assimilated more and more to machines, uh, of moving and functioning like machines. And then conversely, that we have to deal more and more in our reality with invasive but now indispensable machines. They are already indispensable. But what's the price we have to pay for that? Miguel often speaks of hybridization. However, in his studies, he also talks about the risks and the neurophysiological alterations of this hybridization. Paolo Benanti of uh, human enhancement. He talks of human enhancement, in other way, of the possibility of enhancing the human through various uh, chemical, organic, and inorganic supports that are part of our experience that are no longer the subjects or the objects of dystopian films. Now, um, let me uh, give you a brief introduction of our outstanding speakers, guests, uh, of our passionate men, of the passionate men sitting next to me. We have Miguel Benazayag, who is here with us for the first time at the Rimini meeting. Let us uh, uh, have a big applause uh, for him. Miguel was born in Argentina, there he studied medicine, and at the same time he was in the Guevara's guerrilla during the dictatorship. He was arrested three times, he was tortured, and he spent four years in prison. Miguel, thanks, for, uh, thanks to his dual French-Argentinian nationality, uh, then uh, landed in France in 1978, and there he continued his activities as a militant in the Argentinian guerrilla, but he began his clinic and research activities, uh, drawing on the current of the anti-psychiatry and phenomenological psychoanalysis under the guidance of the philosopher and sociologist Pierre Ansar at the University of Paris 7. Around the mid-1980s, uh, together with other personalities, he founded the Malgré Tout Collective uh, community, and he contributed to write in the Manifesto of the Alternative Resistance Network. Today, he lives in Paris, where he continues his work as a psychoanalyst and researcher, working at the interface between epistemology and biology, with a special focus on the problems of childhood and adolescence. He is the author of several successful works, many of which have been translated into Italian, including uh, The Increased Brain, The Decreased Man, uh, Oltre le passioni tristi, dalla solitudine contemporanea alla creazione condivisa, that Cardinal Zuppi has often uh, talked about, referred to uh, in his sessions, then uh, the tyranny of the algorithm, the singularity of the living. And now, Paolo. Paolo Benanti is here for the, first, for the fourth time. He is a third order regular Franciscan and lecturer at the Pontifical Gregorian University where he deals with ethics, bioethics, and ethics of uh, technology. In particular, he deals with the internet and the impact of digital transformation, biotechnology for human en enhancement and biosafety, neurosciences, and neurotechnologies. In 2008, he got his doctorate in moral theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University with a thesis entitled The Cyborg, uh, 
body and corporate in the post-human era, with which he won the Bellarmino Prize, Bellarmino Vedovato Prize in 20. 12. He was part, uh, he was a member of the Artificial Intelligence Task Force to assist the Digital Italy Agency, and he's a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life with a particular mandate for the world of artificial intelligence. Since the end of 2018, he was the member of the group of 30 experts selected by the Ministry for Economic Development to draft the national strategy for two technologies like uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence. He's the work of several works like uh, Post Human 2, Post Human, then Synthetic Reality from Aspirin to life, digital age, so changing age theory, remembering too much, and human in the loop, uh, which is forthcoming. Today, under this title, the mechanization of man and the humanization of the machine, today we would like uh, our two guests express their ideas on six main topics that will be shown to you. You will show them uh, on the screen. First topic is the human being in crisis. And what is the aspect that best connotates this crisis of the human being? Paolo, you have the floor. So, first of all, good morning. Welcome. And uh, to me, it's always a pleasure and honor to be here with you uh, today. There may be many different ways to answer this question. Let us uh, try and trace back this crisis, uh, trace back the roots of this crisis. I believe that one of the first challenges of uh, the machine to the human being uh, took place in the uh, 1900s when the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, laid the foundations to uh, some kind of a fight between the human being and this uh, energy that then led to industrialization. Big industries and the Industrial Revolution led to a situation in which you had some kind of a competition between the strength of the human being and the machine. During the Second World War, uh, war efforts uh, um, basically brought together the most important and skilled uh, workers. And this led to yet another uh, development. Edward Chenner, back then, needed to envisage a new category to answer a technological question. That is to say, how can we provide for a message to travel from London to Washington and back in a safe way? And it was back then that he categorized a new category uh, of being, which was uh, information. Uh, so he remember a precise indication, he's a PhD mentor, PhD supervisor who told it that basically if he didn't want people to ask too many questions, he had to use entropy. So information is basically, according to Shannon, is something that uh, uh, Maxwell needed. Maxwell was the one who first uh, theorized entropy to understand what kind of uh, warm gas molecule had to be used uh, uh, to uh, convey information. In other words, in the 19th century, physics dealt with invisible, invisible things, and so it needed basically uh, certain theoretical constructs uh, to theorize these things. So why uh, is it? Isn't it? possible with work and strength to, um, in a way, envisage everything. So Maxwell theorized that with entropy and the devil. But Shannon uh, did something more and posed yet another question. What does that devil need to understand what molecule has to be conveyed and what molecule doesn't have to be conveyed? And Shannon's answer was a bit of information. Zero, one goes and zero doesn't go. So that's the uh, dichotomy order and disorder, which is associated with uh, information and noise. So from that moment onward, everything that kind of uh, makes a difference can be perceived as information. And the difference that makes the difference, that difference that makes a difference, can bring about information. 
information, and that's generated by information itself. So the, at this stage, there is yet another acceleration push to the Industrial Revolution because that's a, a basic um, reasoning to govern the, the uh, functioning of a machine. And Shannon basically talked about a small mechanical mouse, Theseus, uh, uh, inspired uh, by the myth uh, mythological uh, character who kind of hits against the walls of uh, uh, a maze and therefore changes his direction. And uh, uh, after a while, this, this tiny robot, Theseus, is capable of getting out of the maze. And what happens at this stage? For the first time in 1948, uh, there was a machine which is uh, which was not only uh, some kind of a muscle. Uh, in other words, it seemed to um, be a machine with the properties typical of the human being. The machine has a goal that of finding the exit of a gate of a maze. So the information gives the machine the capacity that was up to, until that moment to become the human being, that of having a, a goal. With the years, with time, this was further theorized by the cybernetic group. There was an American group of researchers. So basically, we are so much used to this way of working of machines that we no longer notice that. that basically, when we enter into a lift, we basically cross until a beam of light, and that kind of is capable of opening the doors of the lift again as if they were smart. So our relationship with the machine is this way transformed. And then in 1982, yet another thing took place. On the 1st of January, 83, Time, the magazine Time, did not elect a person as the man of the year, but basically instead they elected the machine of the year. So the computer has come to birth. The editorial. Uh, commenting that article basically said that it's brilliant and that it, that was going to educate uh, people's children. And basically, you saw on the cover a gray man uh, sitting in front of the computer, and then the computer uh, lit on as an opposition to the man. In the year 2000, uh, digital platforms made it possible to provide an unimaginable calculation uh, capacity and a series of mathematical algorithms that are capable of predicting what was going to happen in the future. So artificial intelligent agents uh, started to work. In 2020, during the pandemic, most of us has lived, have lived in this discrete world of the digital. And we discovered that, as a matter of fact, the digital is some kind of a big container that has to be colonized. And there are other subjective elements, subjective agents existing in there. That is the algorithms. In other words, the uh, human being is facing another uh, sapiens species, that is to say yet another machine that poses yet another question on our specificity. Before that, we used to be the only homo sapiens on the Earth. But now there's the machine. And so who are we? So Miguel, who are we? Is uh, the human being in crisis? First of all, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that I'm going to uh, speak uh, a personal language uh, that uh, Italoñola. Mm, I hope I'll be understandable. So I think you did well in uh, pointing out uh, uh, these two terms, human being and mankind. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, it is appropriate to use the term man. Maybe it's a bit conflictual. It is uh, a fact that uh, mankind is going through a structural crisis when it comes to its way of living the world and of establishing relationships with other species, with the ecosystem. We are aware of the Anthropocene, which is basically this uh, era uh, in which uh, Man uh, is becoming uh, so difficult and so burdensome for the planet that uh, its actions are capable of modifying the entire planet. Uh, this is not done intentionally. This is done in spite of the man because man uh, eventually destroys the planet. Uh, 
Today, we have the need to really define the role and the possibilities we have, uh, the possibilities we have for mankind to establish a new alliance, uh, as Prigojin said. In other words, a new way of inhabiting the world. So in this sense, uh, the digital revolution comes at a time in which, as Simon Don says, uh, there's a way uh, of living, a, a way of existing that are dramatically changing. So as Paolo said, I believe the issue is not so much what the machine is, but rather it's the power of the digital that basically forces us all to pose ourselves the question what the living being is. And I'm not referring to only of the uh, human being, but of living beings in general. Living beings are very peculiar. We are so fascinated by the capacities and the potential of machines that we tend to forget to see what our peculiarities are. So what the peculiarities of the human, uh, of the living being and then of the human being within the living being. So in this respect, it is not possible to look at the future looking back. Uh, we can no longer say that all times uh, uh, we're better than uh, times to come. We have to look at the present times. We have to look to the future. And we have basically to say and to envisage how living beings can inhabit uh, the world coexisting with the incredible power of the digital. The challenge lies exactly here. In other words, the challenge lies in how we can establish this form of hybridization. For the time being, we're sort of colonized. We're not colonized because there's a will on the part of the machines. If machines are capable of kind of pushing down, uh, defeating the skills of the living beings, it's not because of uh, the, it's not because that's an intentional will of the machine, but rather that's our fault. We as living beings do not know how to deal with that. For example, if I live on the sixth floor in my block of flats and there's a lift, if I no longer use my muscles to step up to the sixth floor, I mean, it's not the lift that's to blame if I get disabled gradually. Uh, also, the assimilation of the brain with the digital machine. I mean, these are the things that we need to question. Jean-Pierre Changeur, a, a leading French scientist, 40 years ago talked about neuronal men, the neuronal men. And in this work of his, he basically said that today we are unable uh, to go from the neural state to the mental state. So it's from the mental sorry, state to the neural uh, state. And he also says yet another thing. The neural state, the neural works as if uh, it were a computer at a discrete state. And that has become a reality. We are all convinced of the fact that between the machine and the human being, and the difference is only quantitative. And where does this quantitative uh, reside? Is uh, there ultimately a quantitative difference? So looking for this difference is an urgent need, an urgent challenge we need to solve. Uh, you're absolutely right. Let's now go back to the second topic. And I would try and ask you to stick to five minutes each to your comments. Artifacts and techniques. I'd like to, to start with you, Miguel. Artifacts and techniques. Um, the man has always been trying to build objects in order to modify reality and to improve it, and now also to replicate, replicate it from scratch synthetically. So what's the relationship that today this have with the, the technology and new technologies? You already started answering to this question before. Yes, the man by developing, the person by developing this technology is modifying himself as well. So the human being, uh, before learning how to write, is not the same human being than after learning uh, writing. So these are all what we can define as a co-change, a co-production, basically. So the issue today is that the machine perfectly works. The machine can do number of things, for example, uh, closing the doors of the lift. 
but the, the point here is not only to understand if the machine is working properly or not, but the issue is that the living and the human being uh, specifically uh, do not only have the, the aim of working, but to exist as well. So what does exist mean? Having this kind of uh, anxiety from an existential point of view. So the, the willingness to be here, to find the meaning for the reason why we are here without uh, when we, we don't actually know why we are here. So always uh, questioning, having these questions from a political or ethic point of view. So this space, this uh, uh, issue of the not working, which leaves us alone in front of the existence, this aspect is uh, completely important for the machine. There's nothing to do with the machine. And from this point of view, we need to be extremely careful to that desire to become more and more like the machines. There is also the aesthetic point of view of this aspect of becoming a machine, adapting, uh, adapting to the machine, adapting to the environment as well. Actually, the, the human, the living is not something something that can be adapted, it exists in the co-building with the world. So this means that for the living and the human being specifically, this is not a defect, this is our uh, the, the fault is, plays a key role, and uh, I'm talking about a structural fault, and for the machine there are no faults, there are defects, so either it works or it does not work. So that's where we need to be careful for the relationship between the digital machine, because the digital machine is uh, something which is different from uh, technology. We need to think about the software there, not about the hardware. And the software is, is a very specialized uh, aspect because the Turing machine is a machine without a body, without a space, so nothing to deal with us. Paolo. The evolution of the, the, the man with the artifacts has always been there. And uh, I'd like to add a positive remark for the for a positive approach of the relationship between man and technology. We often hear very negative aspects about that, and we had uh, important philosophers at the beginning of the 19th century considering the artifacts as a something as a something missing on the on the human being. So, uh, there, if we are not uh, fast, running fast like animals or not able to swim like fish or whatever. The technological artifacts is the way we can develop by ourselves in order to fill this gap. But uh, it's hard to understand how a species can develop all that. So how are we uh, asking to fill this gap? Well, I, I'd like to share with you an, anec an anecdote. I went to meet my brothers in Sri Lanka and one of the thing they they wanted me to do was to go to this uh, orphanage of ele for elephants so uh, the the elephants are play a very important role in Sri Lanka and there in that during that experience I had the opportunity to feed an elephant a baby elephant and uh, these baby elephants are eating 25 liters of milk in a very short time. It's, it's an incredible experience. And in that very moment, those uh, baby elephant will never forget you. And there are a lot of little elephants uh, that will never forget many people that helped them in that day. So human beings are not working that way. We don't have a neuronal substrate, sublayer, which is enough for us to remember all the experiences. So we have a surplus here. And 
if we don't want to miss something about what we are telling us today, we need something special. We need some kind of further tools like pen and a piece of paper. So technology is something that we can rely on in order to support uh, this uh, surplus and not to fill a gap of something we are missing. So the history of man is made of these uh, excellences. And one of the first abuses of, of technology has been dealing with something which is useless. Uh, and I'm talking about art, which is like a flower full of meanings. So we learn how to use artificial things and to split the reality between natural and artificial. And what about today? Well, today we are kind of involved uh, within that. Uh, in During Easter 1856, a young student of uh, the Royal College, during Easter holidays, he tried to uh, create the quinine in order to help people not to get uh, ill with malaria. I'm talking about William Perkin, and uh, he made a disaster at the beginning. And while he was cleaning that disaster, he discovered that that substance that he created was very good to color uh, white cotton white fabrics, and his father realized that that color, the uh, blue color he created, had a huge commercial power. Uh, and in that way, he patented that uh, mellow color, and he created synthetic colors. So that's the way that new fabric was created. It was neither natural nor uh, artificial, and it was the synthetic uh, material. The main features were that uh, they didn't, this material didn't have any defects. And as it is for synthetic diamonds, they can be uh, customized with uh, specific codes. And today, we are creating synthetic paints, synthetic materials, and even synthetic lives. SYNC 2.0 is the first living uh, being created in a laboratory which does not exist in the nature and it's been created thanks to a genetic code developed in a synthetic way and that's where we get back to the uh, story I told, you, I told you because when Shannon created the concept of uh, information so difference making the difference uh, phys uh, Nobel Prize for Physics stated that all what does not degradate so basically Shannon starting from Maxwell and entropy, he said that this shall have some kind of information within its context, within its framework, and he theorizes that uh, the living then shall be based on some kind of uh, non-periodic crystal which can convey this information to young medicine students uh, dating back in 1949, uh, read Shannon and start looking for this uh, non-periodic crystal. In 1953, they didn't find it, but they found a double helix, which was the uh, basics for all the life, the information basis for all the life. So starting from the date, also the living is something that can codify information. And thanks to this process, we created a synthetic life, which is not distinguishable from the real life, but created by the man. So, where is the limit of our doing and what does it mean to be alive with comparison with being produced? In my opinion, this is one of the goals of this uh, event, of this meeting today, so to lead to some questions, not only to provide answers, but also to uh, incentive some questions about what we are living, what we are doing. Let me now move to uh, the next topic, the next question reality and imagination. Again, with Miguel, with the language, which is uh, a fundamental characteristic distinguishing the human beings from all other living beings, the man has the possibility, the ability to uh, distinguish between real and unreal. Uh, can the machine with its binary logic made up of zero and one, can, es can it express it? And above all, is it able to experience it by becoming conscious of it? Because this is one of the concerns that uh, within the previous uh, Idea, previous generation's ideas, so thinking about the movie Terminator, there are those machines that will become aware and conscious and will destroy everything, will lead us to ask, our, uh, to ask ourselves this question. Well, the language and the, is the, uh, 
development of all that kind of uh, ad production on the meaning. There's nothing to do with the information that the digital machine can convey. And from this point of view, I cannot imagine how we can have an imagination without a body, without anxiety, without a desire. And that's why all these uh, science fiction of machines that becomes alive and that will kill and destroy human beings, this is kind of a funny thing because if we let ourselves being crushed by machines, that's not the fault of the machine because the machine does not have awareness and does not want to, uh, to do to anything by itself. There is no ability to self uh, direct itself. It doesn't mean relying on a know-how and a knowledge because human and animal knowledge and awareness is completely different. So that's why the question you were asking, it's important to ask ourselves questions about everything. And the first question is, uh, aren't we delegating too much the human functions uh, to the machines because delegating functions to a machine always implies a risk, which is the risk of being less powerful, less able to do things, less able to imagine things. So this confusion of the language, of the imagination with the code, I think this is what we should question here what we should challenge here, because I'm working now with a Japanese researcher, and he is working building robots that are uh, answering, basically. You call for the robot, and the robot will answer. There are also robots doing psychotherapy, and there is another issue there uh, from uh, another point of view. but. He was telling me that then Japanese rather prefer to talk and to exchange information with a robot than with a human being. So the research we, we are carrying out is not only to, is not mainly focused on understanding what the robot does, but we want to see what the robot does. Uh, to the brain of those Japanese people, how it interacts and modifies the brain, because actually the way the robot can actually uh, model the reality, and the reality is a continuum, it's a flow, and this flow does not exist for the machine actually, so what happens there? For the machine, which ha for sorry, for the person that has a too deep relationship with the machine, step by step, this person will modify the way they perceive the world and the way they reflect that in order to adapt themselves to the machine. And this adaptation to the mean to the machine does not mean that machine the machine is winning. The machine does not want anything, but you are self crushing yourself, losing your real direction. You also you often make the example uh, of getting used to use the GPS. I guess we, we ran a research which was free of charge. That's the, that's the reason why we uh, ran that research because, you know, when you carry out a research within limits, it's not very well appreciated because uh, today everything is possible and nothing is real. So we carried out a research focused on the GPS, and we compared a group of taxi drivers in London and a group of taxi drivers in Paris, which are two cities like labyrinths. And the group of taxi drivers in London started their journey without the GPS, while in Paris they immediately started driving with a GPS. So very shortly, after three years, all the members of the group of taxi drivers in Paris Had, their, had a network of, had the subcortical nodes kind of no longer able to work. And while the taxi drivers in London didn't have the same uh, approach. So basically the point is, if I have a GPS available and if I can delegate the GPS to do this function, why shall I? Uh, challenge myself in facing issues uh, that the GPS can solve for me. 
So having these nodes anthropized means no longer being able to orientate yourself in the spa within the space and the time. And considering that uh, human beings have these uh, nodes very well developed, are able to orientate themselves also in a place they've never been before. And uh, they can, they're able to understand and to capture signs and signals, even though they've never been there before. So my colleagues, my research fellows, asking me, why, what are you talking about? Well, the answer is that there is a higher and higher delegation to computers and the real change taking place. And from this point of view, it's not a matter of being against or scared by technology, but it's just a matter of real of thinking how to use uh, the machine without atrophying the uh, functions that make me a living without being obstacled by the machine. So you are talking about being aware, awareness, basically, of uh, the human being with respect to the machine. And the question today is not what the machine can do, but what these kind of stupid things that we are as human beings in front of these incredible machines. I remember I took part in a meeting where there was this uh, championship, this, uh, this champion, this person being a champion in a specific uh, subject who had been defeated by a machine. And there was this uh, uh, comparison between uh, the person and the machine. Oh, well, from an aesthetic point of view, an external point of view, there was an evident uh, difference, a clear difference. And everybody saw uh, the difference and the only thing that people saw was a quantitative difference. And I was the only one having a crazy different idea, which was to see a difference, this difference between uh, the uh, that person and the machine. And for me, the difference, the main difference was that the machine was not actually winning because the machine was not playing actually, because playing and winning, these are concepts that have meaning only for the living and for the human being in particular. The machine is just working. And very shortly, if you think about uh, Galileo, and its rel relative uh, approach. Well, our lift is not going up nor going down. Going up or going down is just a direction that I can uh, provide to this mechanical movement. By, but if we consider the lift by, by itself, it's not going up or down. I'm not saying it's not working. Well, uh, of course, my lifts, the lifts I'm talking about are working. I, but I just mean that the concept of going up or going down they have a meaning which has been provided by the living. Thank you very much. You have explained this point really well. So, Paolo, let me give you a comment in a couple of minutes, uh, just a couple of minutes. We would very, very much like to continue up until, I don't know, for, for much longer time, but we need to, to stick to the time allotted to us. So, okay, let's leave as if we had the luxury of always posing uh, um, questions but never giving answers. This is precisely what uh, Raina Maria Rilke said in letters to a young uh, writer. So, a couple of things. Uh, uh, first, uh, language. Uh, starting from Chomsky, over the last 50 years, we have wondered why our language is different from the one of other beings. All living beings communicate. We know that there are some monkeys who roar like lions just to steal bananas from other lions. And we're not the only ones who even tell lies.
But we are the only species whose language is defined as a syntactic one. Part of my studies, I've made them in the United States and attended lots of Italian migrants, and many, many people, after so many years, were not capable of saying orange, but they said orangio, but they never made mistakes in the syntax. Why are we using this syntactical language. You may well have uh, thoughts about the neuro neuronal functioning, but the fact is that if you have a hammer in your hand, you might wonder why the handle is made like that. It's simply because you, your hand is capable of handling it, of grasping it. But you haven't uh, basically answered the first question. What is a hammer for? So um, in parallel, what is our syntactical language for? We know that languages are all different in terms of syntax. If I tell you I am sad, I am showing you something invisible inside me. So the word is instructing your imagination. And I'm going to be a bit Catholic here. If we, talk, if we are to talk about God, we need the word, otherwise we don't see him. And therefore, uh, language technology makes uh, the invisible visible. But in doing so, it makes visible also things that are no longer there. Bernard Russell used to say that no dog can say that they are, uh, that he's basically the, the son of two uh, honest dogs. And that's because the word makes uh, uh, basically something invisible visible. So language is that technological reality that instructs imagination. And what does this mean here? This is yet another open question. The other issue concerns the machine and therefore our conscience. Uh, to briefly answer your question and drawing on what Miguel has said. So why did the machine that win, uh, didn't that won a certain match didn't win, didn't win the game. That's because the machine can be on and off, but if you turn off the man, you are no longer capable of turning him on again. So computational theory is telling us that the Turing machine can calculate only uh, problems that are equipped with, interrupt, with an interrupt ability. Conscious is a continuous process, and therefore it has not, uh, in, it has no interrupt function, and therefore it uh, cannot uh, uh, be interrupted. La prossima, il prossimo, il nostro prossimo tema. So our next topic. Conflict society. How can we find today common and effective rules in this context? How can we build paths of social agreement, paths of, of construction? There is a, an increasingly social uh, and increasingly real conflict. There is an increasingly heated hatred. That's an age of rage, as Pankai Mishra would define it. So, Miguel, what, what do you think of this? I think that it is normal. We are living in a very violent age, in an age characterized by hatred. Uh, um, the future is a threat. It's an absolute menace, and this is not a lie. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and actually we were saying that uh, when we were young, we thought that we were going to have a, a fantastic future characterized by justice, love, a, a wonderful future lying ahead of us. So, for example, I used to be um, a drum player, uh, a drummer, and then I used to be a Gria man and then a doctor, and now I, that's basically a failure. So the future is a menace, is a threat. And when uh, the future is a threat, well, then it's normal that you have hatred, violence. So the issue here is how we can resist to this. And in this respect, uh, a common 
issue is how we can establish uh, relations, bonds uh, between the others and the environment, with the others and the environment. But however, if we are uh, afraid, we close in ourselves, we are closed in ourselves, we do not want to I mean, look for the other. We look to our own identity, so we kind of divide the world in categories of foreigners, migrants, and us. We need an enemy. The enemy is the best uh, uh, antidepressant that exists. So if you have an enemy, then the world is ordered, and that is why hatred is normal in a society that is afraid. So. Uh, what's the issue of the common? The issue of the common is how we can develop some kind of a common base. And where can we find this uh, community, this possible community? Some people say that the common is uh, uh, given by nationality. Uh, others say that religion is basically the minimum common denominator. Others say that there's just one man, one person, and then all the other men and women have to kind of uh, compare themselves uh, with that man in mind being a model. For example, you uh, this leads to colonialism, then you have universalism, individualism, relativism. So how can you create a minimum common denominator, the common? I think that the common is something that can be built together within the framework of a shared project. And we have to pay attention here. It is very, very easy to, uh, in a way, um, be l brought to to hatred, to feel hatred. I mean, the hatred towards the others or uh, hatred against another religion. Actually, what's, what we have in common is always ahead of us. It's never behind us. It is within a common framework. And I believe that the only thing that can help us face the challenge of this world is finding something in common. Um, having something in common doesn't uh, lead to conflicts. It's quite the opposite because conflicts, uh, uh, clashes can help us develop life. Uh, conflicts uh, help us uh, um, prevent that everything is in a, an opposition. So. We have to start from this assumption. And how can we do this? Of course, each and any one of us has to do this uh, within their own uh, professional border, so to say. Uh, this common has to be produced, has to be made within the framework of a common and shared project. So the future is no longer uh, the future that we used to have in the past. However, there are other players. I'll be very brief, and I'd like to tell you yet another story which in my opinion is quite interesting. That's the story of uh, uh, the of Peter Thiel, who kind of steered uh, all investments in the uh, Silicon Valley. So he's the venture capitalist that is behind all big investment uh, investments in the Capital uh, Valley. He used to go to Stanford at university, and there he got to know a Catholic and heretical Catholic uh, uh, philosopher, René Girard, who was expelled from the European uh, community and who was teaching in the States. And he used to teach mimetic theory, that is to say the theory explaining conflicts. None of us uh, wants one thing for another thing, but he wishes, he wants to have one thing because there's another person who has that same issue. So you can get this uh, parallel from the Bible, from Cain and Abel. Then he uh, also said that basically, uh, symbol after symbol, we see the other, we look at the other, we first admire the other, and then we envy the other, and it is there that conflict stems. Peter Deal, uh, uh, who came originally from South Africa, and he was enlightened by this mimetical theory, and so he founded PayPal. And in order to avoid conflicts in PayPal, he changed uh, the leading roles uh, once every six months so that there is no envy. At the same time, uh, uh, around 2008, he got to learn, he got to know Mark Zuckerberg, a very brilliant man, the founder of Facebook. And there again, he 
uh, was thrilled because Facebook is the IT realization of the mimetic theory. You can look at the other, you can admire him, and then you can envy him and kill him. So Peter Thiel, who was an investor, he decided that it was necessary to monetize that human mechanism. So social networks make it possible to create mechanisms who induce us first to follow the other. So we have followers instead of the disciples. And then we have them envy them with the so-called shit storms. All of this is created with a platform that kind of drains wealth in this uh, turmoil of social agitation. This, of course, increases conflicts in society. In 2008, with the Arab Spring, Twitter seemed to be uh, the Twitter, the tool that would lim liberate us. And then in 2020, with Capitol Hill, we uh, realized that Twitter and other social platforms uh, can earn by injecting uh, hatred into society. The platform basically creates bubbles of antagonism, polarizes us, uh, and therefore makes money out of this polarization. Just think about what happened with the vaccines. Uh, just think about what's happening with the big issues that uh, animate society. So what kind of solution do we have in this respect? Uh, in this respect, I would like to take on an ethical attitude. In the 20th century, companies uh, getting uh, common resources, they would process them and then uh, throw away waste in the environment, and they were taxed. Uh, this was the case of big coal power plants. In this case, we have a company that takes a common asset, a common good, like social agreement, and then basically gets money because it injects into society hatred. So, uh, on a similar note, that same company has to be taxed because they are wasting uh, something, which is hatred, the waste of their own function. So as you can see, there are many contact points between what Miguel and Paolo are saying uh, and what we are witnessing. They are really opening up and paving the way to many uh, future questions. So let's now have a look at the, at the other topic. Singularity and transcendency. Singularity is the uh, transhumanism theory of Ray Kurzweil, which would like to avoid death and guarantee a virtual and digital life by uploading human consciousness into digital media. The singularity of the living that you talk about, Miguel, is something different instead. What are we talking about? So singularity, from a mathematical perspective, is a, a, a point in which things uh, are no longer like before, and Tom defines this as a catastrophe. So a radical change. So basically, we are ordering things in a completely different way. Transhumanism. Transhumanists talk about a life without death. This life without death is a non-life because it means no boundaries. And in this respect, within the Critique de la Raison Pure by Immanuel Kant, there is a very interesting development. Kant was criticizing Plato, and so he used to say, he made the example of a dove who basically thought, okay, if I didn't have air, I could have flown much better. But in fact, with no air, without air, the dove would crash into the ground. And that is because the dove makes confusion between borders, limits with confinement. Limits mean mean actually having uh, the structure of a space where confinement is something that prevents us to develop our whole potential. So. Uh, we have a confinement if you kind of uh, uh, prevent the dove to fly by kind of keeping uh, her wings uh, attached to the body. So all the limits of society are seen as confinements. Uh, it is as if everything had to be abolished. Uh, at the Olympia Theater in Paris, there once was a, a um, TEDx conference. 
and I actually was the last speaker. Uh, I, I, I've always uh, had this uh, uh, task of speaking as the last, of being the last speaker. And there was a French uh, th theorist who wrote a book uh, entitled The Death of Death. His theory was, OK, we're not going to die. We're no longer going to die. And the public basically said, OK, that's me, that's me. I mean, as if it were a lottery. But in fact, this message of having no limits and having only uh, confinement is uh, uh, something wrong. It is uh, barbarism because life without uh, limits is cancer. A uh, limitless thought is psychosis. A uh, limitless language is uh, uh, barbarism. So the problem is not so much whether we can develop uh, new possible things, but rather what the limits are that bring new order to this uh, ever-changing world. We are now going through uh, a new stage, a new phase, uh, um, a stage of new singularity. So things that used to be normal before are no longer considered normal. However, in this new possibility, singularity cannot simply be uh, entering a limitless world. Because if everything is possible, then nothing is real. Singularity should uh, consist in getting to know this peculiarity that the living and the human in the living being can not be made like a machine. So we can we can disassemble a mic and then assemble it again, for example. Even a five-year-old, uh, it's impossible. Uh, even a five-year-old child can, in a way, disassemble a cat, but then nobody can no longer reassemble the cat. This is a singularity of uh, uh, the living being. So finite, finiteness is actually finitude. Is basically what uh, we need to take into account. We need to, um, in a way, uh, get in touch again with this finitude. That doesn't mean that we're not going to innovate. Finitude means that there is a limit, uh, and it's that something. Uh, this limit protects the living being, and within this limit, any confinement can be overcome. So, transcendence uh, is not uh, actually what I deal with, uh, but I believe that any trans, any form of transcendence, uh, has to be lived uh, as something that is outside our limits, but rather as an element of transcendence within immanence. So basically, to try and uh, to define what uh, can transcend, something that can happen here and now. What is possible? Paolo, singularity and transcendency. Transcendence. I would like to underline what Miguel has just said, because basically that's, that perfectly translates the passion for the person, for the human being. There's a, another thing I'd like to mention. We should, again, go back to the origin of information to understand how transcendence has become this other element of information. Everything stems with the Turing test that we heard from the initial reading. Turing said, wondered, actually, when a machine could be smart, when a man. And he basically stated then there, there was a game, an imitation game, that used to be done in society. In other words, you as a person pretend that you are another person, and then by posing questions, you have to imagine what, uh, who that person is. So he modified that. He had a machine and the person behind the wall and then when you are no longer able to tell who the machine and who the human being is, well, then at that stage, in that moment, the machine will be like the man, similar to the man. However, this kind of question is something that radically changes our way of being, our attitude that we as Western world have vis-a-vis -vis reality. On the one hand, we, have, we are biased like counterfeiters. So if 
a banknote, a fake banknote, cannot be told, cannot be distinguished from a, a, an authentic one. Well, uh, uh, does that have the same uh, value? If a robot cannot be told from a human being, is that robot a human being? Uh, is that robot a human being? The problem is explained by Plato in the Republic. He tells that everybody lives in caverns, in caves, and then that we see basically images that confound us. The real knowledge means that we are not content with those images, but we try and see what projects those images. Today, we are content with something that is sufficiently similar, simply to confound our senses. So the problem of disappearing transcendence, the problem of a sky that has become a cloud, the problem of our hope in the future that has become some kind of a backup. So in the past, I used to say uh, um, salvation, but in today, actually, sal uh, salvezza, salvare in Italian, the words are similar. In English, it's uh, saving uh, from salvation. Uh, but today, you have the problem that copies are identical to the original. If you want to have uh, uh, an, an MP3, your copy needs to be similar to yours. There is no uniqueness. And But if uniqueness disappears, you also have uh, you you have this uh, uniqueness uh, disappear that is basically characterized by the imminence in the trans transcendence in the imminence. We carried out a new Turing test to check if the machine is really capable of being stupid like human beings. When the machine is able to be stupid as we are, so in a way be subject to passions, a slave of passions, uh, to feel a desire, well, on that day, that day would be really um, um, alarming. Stupidity, in my opinion, lies in this characteristic that makes it possible for us to love, to create, to do art. So this uh, stupidity, for the time being, uh, uh, cannot be reached by machines. So allow me just one thing. So what's dangerous, not so much artificial intelligence, but natural stupidity. Nice joke, thank you. Uh, and here we are at the very last topic we'll, we will face together for uh, this meeting. And I think it's very important, a very important topic and I think we already touched upon this topic uh, with the previous uh, uh, speeches. So here it is, an alliance for the human. So here, here at the meeting for friendship between people, so the meeting was created with the idea of a real friendship, possible uh, between every person, so different kind of people, uh, with different cultures, genders, races, and so on and so forth. So based with a basic question, and the challenge we are facing today is uh, how can we review and rethink educational, social, and productive processes and the importance of relationships and, of fr and friendships between uh, humans today as we are here today in this moment because uh, the first thing we saw earlier, so the first question, if the human being is uh, facing a crisis, in order to uh, give an answer to this crisis, we need an alliance. We need to have the possibility to provide an answer. For, what do you think about that, Miguel? Well, actually, I think that we need to forget all the utopia of uh, uh, a universal uh, thing which will uh, solve the reality for the world. I, I think we we made a mistake when we thought about the human being because we thought that the human being was able to uh, overcome all the negative aspects, all that stupidity which is part of us, all that violence which is part of us. So friendship and love and the creation and justice are possible. What is not possible is to if we to achieve that if we only want that. So uh, light without shadows. 
that's the challenge we will have to face. How can we do that after centuries uh, where we looked for an absolutely enlightened world without any kind of dark aspect? How can we rethink the human being as a, a real human being? And this real human being, which was not only made of uh, friendship, love, and justice, but it's made, he's made also by hatred and conflicts and negative aspects. And I think that uh, today, in order to have a possibility to build, rebuild something without only considering everything as a distraction, we, think to, uh, we need to think about that in a more developed way. So a real, tangible human being without cutting that with specific sides, with specific peculiarities that we only consider as positives, positive sides. So that's the challenge, to consider our reality within a global aspect, which also includes the negative aspects. Thank you for your answer. Paolo? Well, the countdown is running fast, so I totally agree with uh, uh, what Miguel just said, and we can call it as a drum of the sinner. And let me add that the machine is something that we use and that has a goal. And I think that friendship comes when the other no longer have a goal but a meaning. So what does it mean? That It means that uh, we need to get back to rediscover that if I'm touching a table, if I touch an object, I'm touching something. But when, I'm, when I touch a person, I'm touching someone. So I'm touching, but I'm touched as well at the same time. So this mutual approach makes makes it in a way that uh, I can use a piece of iron, but I need to receive a person, and you need to understand who I am and vice versa. So why uh, cannot we understand the human being? Maybe because there's no another uh, person, there's not a you again uh, within that. So uh, that's based also on St. Francis that uh, for all his life asked, who are you and who am I? And uh, I visited the exhibition of Don Giussani, and I think that's the basis of the, uni the, the experience of someone who tried to look for his uh, unity and his uh, self till the very deep of themselves. So this is something in which we can choose if we want to be part of a guerrilla or if we want to choose a partner for all our life. So that's the only way to have a mutual approach to discover myself and the real value for who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, because uh, what we said at the beginning, uh, two very passionate uh, men uh, that really shared with us all their power, all their strength. And there is a further point. You know, the title for this year of the meeting is Passion for the Person, and the word uh, passion includes uh, meaning with other words. So when we talk about passion, we talk about we're talking about a passion for uh, between lovers, for example, something like a fire burning. But when we talk about passion, we also uh, talk about suffer, uh, pain, and suffering, and the word passion furthermore involves the meaning of patience. So waiting for something, which is not just waiting for a bus or for a delayed train. No, I'm talking about the patience, which is a commitment. What Miguel said in French uh, with the, the French way of saying être en pied. So being there, keeping on watching ahead and looking for a meaning that can be there. Uh, in uh, in life, so in French we they we can be defined with uh, rester debout. So building a friendship which can change the world. Thank you, thank you, everybody. And let me remind you that the meeting is a place of friendship and culture. That uh, in order to exist uh, and to be free, completely free and free of charge since its very first edition in 1980. This serves your support so you can find uh, the Donate Now desks where you can, if you want, you can contribute to the meeting. Once again, a round of applause for Paolo and Miguel.
la civiltà dell'amore. Fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta sì. don giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui dio entra nella nostra esistenza Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte da cui viene il grido.